Goedendag en hartelijk welkom bij Blok op de Schietbaan. Vandaag kijken we naar een prachtige Kronblen geweer 1871 voor de Belgische burgerwacht. Oh, awfully sorry, I must have had one delirium tremens too many. Um, as I was saying, uh, welcome to Bloke on the Range. Today we're going to look at the Comblanc rifle um, 1871 model for the Belgian Civil Guard. So before we go into detail about the gun, let's talk quickly about who it was for. So the uh, Belgian Civil Guard was a, uh, a civilian uh, force to keep the peace within the Belgian territory and they were completely separate from the Belgian army. In fact, one of the requirements was that you should have uh, no attachment to the military, either as a active serviceman or in the reserve. So it was really uh, a complete separation between the two, and the war ministry was not responsible for the civil guard. And the other condition was that you had to be unmarried, so that meant uh, single, um, or even widowers for the elderly uh, members. Uh, you could be between age 21 and 50. And um, yes, you would be expected to uh, you know, keep the peace in, uh, in the cities, um, help out in case of emergencies, deal with riots, uprisings, that kind of thing. You know, you know, I guess if things got really hot, the army would also step in, but uh, the civil guard was supposed to take care of most things. And it was set up um, right at the beginning of independent Belgium, so from uh, 1830. And um, they were quite busy at the beginning, as you can imagine, when uh, a country is being formed and governments and the various factions trying to vie for power. Uh, they were quite busy in the first couple of years. And then they kind of lost a bit of purpose simply because there's nothing much to do. Uh, they were seen as a bit of a joke, you know, sort of uh, weekend soldiers strutting around in the smart dark green uniforms, but um, not really doing anything. Nevertheless, they were still uh, tried on a couple of occasions. Um, 1847, there was a very bad harvest in Belgium, and you can imagine that tensions were high, so they were uh, put to work making sure the civilians were as restful as possible. And then the following year, 1848, there was, guess what, another revolution in France. And... Um, there came the uh, formation of the Second Empire, and of course that made Belgium, as a relatively new independent nation, a bit nervous to have their neighbour suddenly kick off and uh, you're never sure what they're going to do. But perhaps the most important job uh, in the history book nowadays is uh, in 1914, when the Germans jackbooted the back door in. Um, the Civil Guard were explicitly told to not interfere, and Indeed, many of the younger members said, all right, went home, ditched their gear and went and joined the army. Um, but those who were perhaps too old or um, were for other reasons unable to do so, they still grabbed their rifles and joined in the fight. And um, don't think that all of them were armed with Mausers, far from it. Uh, the Comblain in this guise and the later models were still very much in use and um, apparently Records show they gave just as good as they got. Now, as I said, they were more or less officially uh, shut down in 1914. Um, but, in fact, the final um, closure by royal decree only came in 1920. So, that's the people who used them. Now, let's see about the rifle itself. So what is a Comblain rifle? Well, it is a very nice, sleek and compact single-shot breech-loading rifle. It is of the falling block variety, more specifically a uh, self-disemboweling falling block. As you can see, you've got everything drops out the bottom. The block, trigger mechanism, lock work, everything. It is uh, self-ejecting, self-cocking and weighs a ton. Now this weighs obviously more than it should because it's made of phosphor bronze and um, the idea was initially that this would be wonderful because it's great to machine, which is fine, which is good, um, but in fact it was a bit of a false economy. Um, it is a bit softer than steel, obviously not a problem 
a real problem for uh, the black powder cartridges of the time, but um, there is something that occurs with these that uh, I'll show you later. Anyway, they quickly realized the problem and after about eight and a half thousand of these, they changed to steel. So, Cormelin, who was he? Well, he was a uh, gunsmith who was active in Liège area. Uh, he was already, you know, getting on into his 50s when he came up with this one. Uh, prior to that, he'd been quietly tinkering away. He made, uh, apparently, a very robust uh, side lock and side hammer percussion revolver. Um, also, he sent a trials rifle to the UK, which is uh, sometimes known as the Riley Comblain, or uh, Comblain 1, which is uh, an up, a sort of uh, a take on the Enfield percussion musket with a tilting up breech block uh, acted, activated by a side lever uh, that obviously didn't get anywhere. And um, this was next, and this is sometimes known as the Comblain 2. Now, if you look at the uh, the top of the action there, some of you who are familiar with the uh, Browning, or should I say Winchester High Wall, will see this and say it looks quite familiar. Um, and yes, uh, they operate, well, they have the same function. They have a vertical dropping block. Uh, they have self-cocking mechanism. But um, as you'll see, John Browning really did overcomplicate things. Is it safe? You all right? Am I forgiven? I only said he overcomplicated it. I didn't say it was bad. Now, anyway, seriously, let's have a look at just how simple this thing is. So in order to take the action out, all you need to do is remove that screw and we're in. So let's do this. Now the soldiers, or should I say guardsmen, will be provided with a multi-tool, which included a uh, mainspring clamp, a, uh, an oil bottle and screwdriver, all in, in one tool. So take that out. And there we have it. That's all there is to it. Now this actually looks more complicated than it looks. There's actually very few parts. Shall we go further? Let's. Now I mentioned that the tool would have a spring clamp and basically it looked like one of these, but uh, closed in. This is the uh, updated chap version. And the only spring in the system is a V-spring, which is in this housing here at the back. And uh, that puts pressure on the hammer. And also, so with one limb and the other limb, puts pressure on the trigger. And here we have one axis screw on which the whole thing pivots. And the other one is a retainer. So I shall just relax the main spring. Until you can flip the tail of the hammer off a little bit more. There you go. The mainspring. And now everything's loose. So. So that's one piece, one big massive casting, and this certainly weighs a bunch, and uh, you'll see what this surface is for in a minute. And then we have the hammer with a little uh, hook for the mainspring, you have a half cock notch and a firing notch. Now this half cock notch is really very shallow, so uh, I certainly wouldn't use it as a safety. And then we have housing. 
and the trigger which is housed in there and here sits the mainspring so in fact two castings a spring and uh, the hammer now the firing pin in this case was removable this one's been redone and uh, it floats a bit now you'll notice that there's a big round disc here now this is not original um, I mentioned there was a problem with the the bronze and what happened over time and this one's been even though it's in good condition it was heavily used and the uh, the hammer that I say the firing pin pokes through this hole in the breech block which means that the there's very little material around the hole on the breech face and after thousands of rounds um, you do start to get a little uh, a shallow dishing or primer shaped dish here around the firing pin and uh, this had got to the extreme that I was getting pierced primers and pierced and primers backing out and all sorts so a uh, very clever old school gunsmith here um, put in this very nice bushing which is threaded and soldered in place so uh, it's good to go for a, another couple of uh, decades I'm sure now, I've also heard it heard have heard that it also happens in the steel ones but to a lesser degree and you still have end up with the same problem that you've got a very thin bit of, uh, of metal around this hole so because this is bloke on the range and we show you everything let's put it back together again hopefully it won't be too long or if it is it'll be sped up and if I make a mistake it'll be done again loose now the mainspring which is the fiddly bit there so now I just need to use my tool half now wind the tool out again and then push the tail of the mainspring in and hook the hook on the end of the hammer over it hopefully not break the spring nor ping it across the workshop Not sure about do it, not quite. There we And there we go. There wasn't too much off camera. Back in the business. Now I'd love to show you how it works in practice. Oh yes, and basically the thing that's left there is the ejector. And I'll take it out now because I want to show you how it behaves inside the breech block. And because this is bloke in the range and we can't afford a pet 3D animator, I have made this, which is a replica of half of the receiver and as you can see it's very very plain there's there's nothing going on here no springs coming out or or whatever there's just a big hole and this hollow here and this space in the top and this trapezoidal slot which is obviously on both sides which you can see in there that's all there is to it it's a 
simple as you can get. So let's see how this behaves in there. Put the right way in, that'll be that way. Okay, so this is what it looks like in the shut position. See the breech block is nice and firmly pushed up in its slot there, and it's pushed up against the breech face. The ejector is uh, nested there underneath. And uh, so what happens when you pull the lever? Watch carefully, I'll try and do it slowly for you. Everything gets pulled back, the hammer is pushed up. Let's see, where's a pokey thing? I need a pokey thing. You have to be a pencil. There's the, a note, there's a uh, piece here on the front of the trigger, of the hammer, sorry, that is being pushed against by this block on the lever. So that's going to push back on the hammer and pivot it backwards. And you can see that happening there. And that's the half cock. Obviously, the uh, ejector would be pressed up. It's uh, a bit loose in this little model. And then when you go to full lever swing, you have the nose here on the front of the lever, whacks the ejector back and throws the cartridge straight out of the back. And the hammer is now at full cock. So you see the the, um, the breech block actually bends because you've got two locking pieces. You've got this side here, this top bit, but also this bit at the bottom because that equally when you raise the block sits flush in the slot at the bottom. So you have a, slot, a uh, recess at the bottom and a recess at the top. Like here, that one there and that one there. So it's an extremely strong and extremely simple system. Now remember when I blasphemed against uh, J.M. Browning, here's a picture of the inside of the low wall. As you can see, this one is a lot simpler. Now the Comblan was, uh, the rifle at least, was chambered for the uh, 11x50R cartridge, which is this little stubby with a very short bottleneck. Um, this was the uh, cartridge in use in the army with the Albini Brendlin rifle, so it was uh, logical that they would use the same cartridge. And um, when the Belgian army did use the Comblain, but only as a cavalry carbine, and there they had a slightly shorter round 11 by 42. So let's put that, this back together where it belongs. If he wants to come out, I think it's quite comfortable in there. And there we go. There, so, practice, and by the way, this is a dummy, open it, and you have a nice access there to pop your round in, straight in, close the block, fire. Now, the funny thing is, is that uh, you'd expect a lever like this that you would use at the back, and I mean, you can get a grip here, but there's a very strong spring here which retains the block and uh, allows you to build up a little potential energy when you're opening the block so that it 
everything moves forward explosively when you release. Um, but that's not where you're supposed to put your hand to open the action. Um, you're not supposed to put it behind, so you can't put it there because this trigger assembly is in the way. And you can't really move it downwards either because you don't have enough moment to break the, uh, the spring force there. No, what you're supposed to do is once you fire it, is you bring your hand round, your thumb into the front here, and just vigorously push forward. And out goes the cartridge. Very, very positive ejection. And something I have noticed when I was uh, at the range, um, I used to shoot this without a sling on it. And I don't use a sling, but what I did find when not using a sling is that sometimes this would go back. And when you open it, is that sometimes this would stick there. And that means the ejector doesn't work. It doesn't hit. And I was puzzled why I wasn't getting extraction and working the lever like an idiot until I noticed that that was in the way. So obviously when you've got a sling attached, this is always at least vertical and it doesn't interfere. Something to bear in mind. Anyway, now we've seen the secrets of the breech, there is an additional secret and that is in the barrel and that I can only show you on the range. So let's go. So here we are on our favorite noisy range and uh, let me show you the secret I was talking about. This is a uh, reloaded version of the official Belgian round, so 11 by 50 R. It's got a short bottleneck. And this one's got a little bit of a bulge because it's been uh, converted from 50, 90 sharps and shot in this chamber, but uh, it's now um, fits nicely. Uh, I've thickened the rim with a uh, bit of key ring that had to be lying around because the original rim was a bit thicker. Anyway. This is as close as you can get without uh, finding particular special brass for it. So, what happens when we fire it? Let's drop it in. Bolt. Now the, weak, the spring is a bit weak on this, so I may have to recock, but we'll see. Not the important bit. Okay, it's gone off, eject, <clears throat> and this is the fired case. I've been shooting this, so that's why it's absolutely filthy, but you can see that uh, the neck has completely gone. And that's because the chamber looks like this. So as you can see, the chamber is actually far longer than the uh, chambered cartridge and uh, the idea behind that was this extra space in front would could uh, build up with fouling all day and it wouldn't hinder the use of the rifle so from a military standpoint fantastic um, from a modern reloader's perspective it's absolute hell uh, because every time you're forming uh, you have to reform this shoulder and the brass and that's going to work it to death and your cases aren't going to last very long. Um, in fact, it was also a problem back then um, because they did reload and um, so they came up with something which I've unfortunately not been able to find a picture of but it's basically um, a little ring that you would put over the shoulder and either reduce or stop the expansion. Um, nowadays there's another solution and that is, excuse me, and that is to turn yourself some cases to the length of the chamber. So if we compare the two, you can see there's quite a difference and uh, there's one I have fired earlier, as they say. Yeah. 
There you go, and it basically hasn't budged. Um, the neck, the mouth has uh, expanded a little, little bevel here that has, uh, has expanded out. But otherwise, that's fine. Um, so these are very, very thick walled uh, cartridges and they hold a maximum of 55 grains of powder. And there's a little step inside so that the bullet seats correctly at the same point and it looks like this and it shoots very well um, how many have I got through now one two three I've got nine shots off this one unfortunately is a reject because the uh, primer hole has been drilled too deep and it's not going off they weren't mine I have to add so I've had to re um, reshape them slightly on my uh, Kyber lathe so they fit my chamber. So um, I have another five shots to do with these new reloads um, and let's see what we do. Now, I must admit I'm doing it from sitting down because I do really want to see what this, cap this rifle is capable of and not what mistakes I'm capable of. Since I'm doing leisurely shooting um, I'm dipping the bullets each time in a, uh, an udder cream Martini shooters will know this as uh, utterly smooth. I think I believe that's an Australian make. Um, yeah, and it keeps the fouling soft. Uh, doesn't matter when you're doing leisurely range shooting. So there you go. That's why these have got funny white stuff on the tip. Stop it. Okay, so hopefully there'll be 15 shots on target. Let's go and see. So, what have we got? Ooh, pretty. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. This one was when I got cocky at the beginning and fired it freehand. Uh, just goes to show, really. But otherwise, I think. The cases obviously work brilliantly, so it was well worth those long hours in the workshop adjusting those cases to fit. And the bullet also seems to work very well. It's a hard cast uh, Berries 457, uh, so 4570 fair, as most of these 11 millimeter something take. So before we wrap up, let me bring the camera around quickly and uh, show you just the ridiculousness of this chamber. So this is a rough and ready chamber cast, just to show you what it's like. You can see there's a fairly sharp transition between the chamber and the rifling, which starts more or less straight away. And then when we line that up with the regulation cartridge, you can see how odd it really is. It's a uh, it's a good five millimeters shorter than uh, the chamber. And uh, well, that explains why the whole thing blows out. Now, oddly enough, when they revised a few bits of the design in the uh, 1880s, uh, they stuck with this chamber. They, I mean, it was pretty obvious by then that a, a, a chamber well fitted to the cartridge or the other way around cartridge well fitted to the chamber was far far better um, ballistically than this weird thing but uh, they stuck it out for some reason so this is then the cartridge that I am using to avoid all this resizing nonsense now it's still ever so slightly shorter but um, as you can see the chamber walls are very very thick probably around uh, just under a millimeter thick now there's a step if you can see 
and then like there's a step in there for the base of the bullet now that doesn't really need to be there but um i say this was this was made by someone else for their either combla or albini um so uh, i'm living with what i have so the sharp eye amongst you will have noticed the bayonet at the beginning of this video and uh, here it is basically it's uh, identical to the Chassepot bayonet um, only the markings are different this one just has two very very discreet Auguste Francotte stamps so uh, matching the maker of the rifle and um, yes it fits in as much as uh, Chassepot bayonets fit since they're all individually fitted to their rifle um, the scabbard is different however it's uh, clad in black leather and has brass fittings. So um, the Civil Guard rifle did go through um, upgrades. Uh, 1881 and 1882 uh, there was a new version brought out which basically functioned and had the same parts. It was just put together slightly differently. They optimised the, the production and quality and the uh, bayonet uh, was changed to an one under the barrel and with a T cross-section blade much like the Gras. Um, as I mentioned very early as well, the Belgian army never really adopted, well they never did adopt the rifle. Uh, the cavalry, ca cavalry had a carbine, uh, as did the artillery train, and um, back in the sort of civilian area there was a little carbine for um, forestry guards and uh, rural police, that kind of thing. That was it in terms of uh, Belgian service, however the vast majority went to South America where they apparently really loved this thing. This thing. I mean in terms of uh, single shot breech loading rifle it's, it's hard to fault back in the day. And uh, yes Brazil, Chile, Peru, uh, they had huge orders of these things and if you want to know more about them find this book and it'll have all the details you could possibly wish for, contracts, serial numbers, markings, the lot. And um, other Otherwise, also Morocco ordered some, and there is speculation as to uh, some going to Persia too. Oh, I forgot to mention that um, if you look at several Comblain, you'll probably notice that there are a vast number of makers' stamps on them, and that's completely normal. Um, Comblain didn't produce many himself, um, you know, he didn't have the industrial capacity, however, Liège did, and it was sort of a Liège custom to form syndicates uh, in order to to uh, be able to fulfill substantial orders and uh, you know everyone would make se several parts and someone else would assemble them all um, and that sort of thing so um, this one is marked Auguste Francotte but um, there's several others who would be within the same syndicate uh, Pirlo, Beurre Frère, um, Mordant, another one anyway um, these syndicates were rather fluid so some of them lasted a few years sometimes just one or two um, and of course the largest one was of course FN which is still with us today although not really a syndicate anymore but the founding members were back then the same ones that were producing Comblain rifles so um, I think we've exhausted the subject now I'm hoping you're still awake um, thank you if you are still awake for your patience and I hope this provided some information on this fascinating and uh, perhaps not so common breech loading uh, black powder rifle so i shall see you next time thank you in the meantime for all your support and particularly on patreon we really appreciate that and uh, see you again on the range or in the workshop bye